Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, February 3rd, 2022. I am delighted to be back with Professor Alexei Kataev. Alexei, it's good to be with you again. Thank you. Alexei, today I'd like to start with some of the research that you were doing in the early 2000s. We talked in our first discussion about Majorana fermions. You wrote a paper on unpaired Majorana fermions in quantum wires. What are quantum wires? A quantum wire is a, an essentially one-dimensional system. It can be made uh, out of a semiconductor uh, such that uh, the transversal motion is quantized and effectively electrons only move in one direction. But uh, at the time, I didn't know how to make such a wire. It was just uh, uh, an abstract model, how to write down a Hamiltonian that would uh, have certain interesting features. Now you say at the time, what progress has been made in the field since 2000? Uh, since uh, 2000, uh, other people found how to actually make, uh, make such wires uh, with uh, existing materials. And uh, one needs a combination of uh, uh, three properties, uh, which I knew at the time, but I didn't know about uh, concrete examples. So uh, it should be a system with a strong spin orbit interaction. Uh, there must be uh, a superconductor, uh, uh, for example, in proximity to that wire. And uh, third, uh, there must be a magnetic field, uh, something that breaks uh, the time reversal symmetry, which is usually broken by magnetic field. Alexei, that same year, and, uh, along, with, along with Daniel Gottesman and John Preskill, you wrote the paper encoding a qubit in an oscillator. In what way did that paper reflect some of the new thinking about quantum error correcting codes? Um, it's a different type of an error correcting code. Uh, the usual error correcting co uh, codes are uh, based on qubits. One qubit is encoded into many. Uh, one can encode uh, a qubit into uh, in a quantum many body system uh, also, but uh, this code is an encoding in a pretty simple uh, quantum mechanical system, a harmonic oscillator. It's not a qubit, it has um, multiple uh, states. But uh, yeah, so it's a new, new, new type of code. And uh, it, it has been uh, implemented recently uh, by a DeVarez group at Yale. Which gets us where? What's what's the progress there? Uh, they realized this uh, uh, this code. Uh, they uh, figured how to uh, do the stabilizing measurements uh, uh, on, on on the quantum state, uh, and uh, the quantum state is realized uh, using a, uh, an electromagnetic resonator, and uh, uh, the measurement measurements are done uh, by in interaction of this superconducting resonator with uh, a superconducting qubit uh, based on JSON junctions. Uh, so uh, they can store a qubit for some time. It, it's, it's pretty short. It's uh, only slightly better than uh, uh, without encoding. I mean, if uh, the ancilla is used uh, uh, as a qubit, it would be uh, almost as good as uh, as the code that's uh, the current state of the art, but uh, one can hope that things will improve. Tell me about some because, of your. Uh, tell me about some of your collaboration with Michael Friedman at Microsoft. What were you working on with him in the early two thousands? Uh, we were working on uh, topological quantum computation. Uh, Michael Friedman. Uh, he had a, a similar idea to mine uh, about uh, the same time uh, uh, as I wrote my paper in 1997 uh, about uh, anions, quantum computation with anions. And uh, uh, we were working on uh, various schemes of anionic computation. 
Uh, and in particular, we were interested in uh, simulating uh, the general uh, quantum, uh, quantum computer using anions or using other top, uh, topological uh, systems. Uh, well, uh, anions are uh, particles that uh, exist in a fixed system of uh, fixed geometry, say we uh, create a, a two-dimensional system, it's a, it lives uh, uh, on a plane and uh, we can uh, excite the system, uh, the excitations are anions and we, we can uh, drag them, move them around and do a, a computation. But uh, that requires uh, pretty sophisticated anions. Uh, another way of doing computation, if we can change the geometry or topology of the system itself, if we can, uh, uh, say, cut holes, attach uh, tubes uh, uh, connecting in different holes and uh, things like that. And uh, we were uh, studying both settings and we were approving results uh, like uh, uh, equivalence uh, uh, between the standard model of quantum computation and uh, uh, the topological model. Alexei, tell me about your motivations in writing, along with Alexander Shen and Mikhail Vialyi, the textbook Classical and Quantum Computation. Why did the field need an introductory book that looked at both classical and quantum computers? at this time, 2002. Uh, first, at that time, uh, there, there weren't many books on quantum computation, so uh, a quantum computation book uh, was certainly needed. Uh, actually, a, a Russian version of, of, this, of this book I, I, I appeared earlier. I forgot uh, what year, maybe in uh, 1999, I, I'm not completely sure. Uh, and uh, the original version was based on uh, lectures uh, I, I, I gave in, at uh, the independent Moscow, Moscow University. But uh, so it was a lecture course, then they, uh, it, it became, a, it, a book uh, in Russian, and uh, the English version included more material. Where did you uh, know Alexander and Mikhail from? Uh, um, Mikhail Vialy uh, is my friend. Uh, he's uh, uh, still in Moscow. And uh, uh, Alexander Shen... Uh, I, I also knew him. Uh, he's a computer scientist. Uh, now he works in France. Uh, and uh, at the time, we were, were all in Moscow, and uh, I attended uh, a, co uh, a complexity theory seminar uh, on a regular basis, and uh, we usually met there and talked. So. Uh, it was uh, a community I, I belonged to. And and why did the book include information on classical computing? Why was it important to survey classical computing and compare that with quantum computing? What was the value in that? Well, uh, it, it's still my firm conviction today that... Uh, Classical computation is a prerequisite uh, for quantum computation. Uh, and uh, uh, to understand what uh, uh, quantum computation is, uh, you need to know quantum mechanics, but uh, you also need uh, uh, some concepts uh, from complexity theory. Uh, it's important to understand that uh, uh, there are different models of computation uh, and uh, all these models are equivalent in the sense that uh, all computers uh, can compute uh, exactly the same things. Uh, there are some differences uh, in, in the complexity of computation. One model may be more efficient uh, than another, 
uh, all natural classical models are equivalent up to polynomial factors and uh, uh, more often even up to logarithmic factors. And uh, when we add quantum elements to it, uh, one can in principle achieve an exponential speed up. So uh, it's important to uh, just uh, have a general theory uh, that includes uh, models and uh, transformations between models. And uh, that's the purpose of the classical part of the book. We talked about quantum protocols previously. Your work with Preskill and also Dominic Mayer's super selection rules and quantum protocols. What are super selection rules? Super selection rules uh, uh, is a concept related to anions uh, or other particles. Uh, and uh, the name comes uh, uh, from uh, a previous concept uh, called selection rules. Selection rules in quantum mechanics uh, are rules that uh, say certain transitions are allowed by symmetry and other transitions are not allowed. Uh, it, it's important uh, uh, to understand uh, atomic spectra, for example, uh, when uh, uh, an atom em emits a, a photon, uh, it, it cannot go from any level to any other level. Uh, there are some uh, constraints, and uh, these are called selection rules. Now, uh, super selection rules uh, are in a way similar, but uh, they deal with uh, uh, processes uh, be uh, between particles. What, what can happen when uh, uh, particles collide and uh, uh, produce other particles? Uh, these constraints. Uh, uh, are often related to gauge symmetry. It's uh, different from uh, global symmetries uh, that are relevant to atoms. Uh, but uh, one can uh, also say that uh, those super selection rules are, are, are actually more fundamental than the gauge theory. The, uh, the gauge theory is just a way to represent uh, these rules. Uh, it, it, in a given system, uh, excitations uh, excite, uh, which we view as particles, uh, may have some constraints, like uh, the electric charge is conserved. And uh, uh, in uh, anionic systems, uh, uh, we can say that, uh, for example, uh, a Z2 charge uh, can be conserved. Uh, surface codes, uh, these are uh, systems that uh, are, are built. Uh, of uh, qubits interacting with each other in two dimensions. Uh, they could be built from other elements. It's uh, uh, not known how to do it well, but in principle, they, they could be built uh, from spins also. Uh, these are systems where uh, there is no pre-existing uh, selection rule or uh, conservation law. Uh, one uh, can do anything with spins. Uh, all, all symmetries can be broken. Uh, yet, uh, when those spins interact, they form an entangled state. And uh, uh, this is uh, the ground state or, or vacuum. People call it vacuum also because it's analogous to uh, the vacuum we live in. It's not uh, just an empty space. It's actually a, a more complex thing. And uh, this... Uh, uh, entangled state of, of spins uh, can be in, a, uh, in the ground state or in an excited state. Uh, uh, excitations are quasi-particles and uh, uh, in uh, this particular system, those quasi-particles are conserved modulo two so that you cannot produce a single quasi-particle. You, you, when you do anything with this system uh, locally, not uh, destroying the whole thing, but uh, just changing it locally, you can produce two particles, but not one. In what way did this research suggest that there was interesting work happening in quantum cryptography at this point? Um, well, uh, 
Actually, I, I don't remember so well this uh, this work. I, I, somehow I'm not so interested about cryptography. So uh, I, I, I don't remember. Do you have a sense of when the National Security Agency started to get concerned about quantum computers and internet security? I don't know. Well, uh, they may be concerned that uh, uh, another country like China will make a quantum computer, and uh, uh, that could be a concern. Uh, uh, but uh, quantum computers will not be uh, available to uh, many users for for a long time. So. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what uh, they're going to be concerned. Uh, they should be uh, concerned now because uh, uh, when uh, quantum com computers are made, uh, it will take time to change the codes, and uh, this uh, has to be done everywhere, uh, including consumer systems. So it's a long process. Uh, these codes uh, sh should be... Uh, well, some codes already exist that are not known how to break on a quantum computer. Uh, so uh, one needs to uh, find the efficient variants of those codes, uh, write software, test it, deploy it. So it's a long process. So uh, I suppose they should be concerned. And, uh, probably they are, but I don't know. Alexei, your work with Sergei Bravier in 2005 on universal quantum computation. What, what does that mean? What is universal quantum computation? Universal uh, means you, you can compute uh, uh, anything. There are some restricted models of computation where you can do certain operations, but uh, you cannot really do much. These models are still interesting uh, to study some properties of quantum system, and uh, they're interesting mathematically. But uh, eventually, we want uh, universal computation, such that uh, we can uh, compute anything. And what does that mean, compute anything? Uh, well, uh, you can uh, compute any function. You have some uh, inputs and outputs. And for example, uh, you can add two numbers, you can multiply numbers, you can uh, split a, a, an integer into prime factors. So any uh, of this algorithmic uh, task is doable. And uh, in a classical computer, uh, they are all doable if you have a certain set of Boolean gates. Uh, for example, if you have uh, the AND, OR, and NOT gates, then you can do anything. If you only have, uh, say, uh, uh, the AND and OR gates, but uh, no uh, not gate, then there are some restrictions on what you can compute. That same year, your work on uni universal manifold pairings and positivity. Another question about universality. What does that mean, universal manifold pairings? I, I actually don't know why it's called universal. Uh, I'm trying to remember uh, why this name. Uh, yes, uh, I do remember. Uh, pairing uh, between manifolds uh, means that uh, we glue two manifolds with boundary along that boundary and construct a closed manifold. Like uh, we can uh, glue it to uh, semi-spheres uh, to make a sphere. And uh, uh, there are invariants uh, of three manifolds where uh, a three manifold with the boundary uh, defines a quantum state associated with that boundary. And when we glue two manifolds, uh, we can uh, we construct the inner product between the corresponding states. Uh, 
Now, uh, this pairing between uh, Hilbert spaces depends on uh, a topological theory. There is, uh, there is a way to associate uh, uh, Hilbert's, Hilbert spaces with, uh, with uh, two-dimensional manifolds and uh, uh, vectors uh, with three-dimensional manifolds uh, whose boundary is the two-dimensional manifold. But uh, such a theory is not unique. There are many ways to do so. And uh, each, uh, each such theory uh, defines uh, a, a new, a new uh, pairing in you in a product and uh, what we studied in that paper is uh, uh, just uh, the general inner product between manifolds themselves so that was the idea of universality we and uh, I, my my contribution to this work was very minor by the way it was uh, mostly uh, my, michael friedman's work We've talked a lot about anions. One paper, a sole author paper in 2006, anions in an exactly solved model and beyond. What is an exactly solved model? Uh, when we consider a, a classical or a quantum model, uh, it's defined by a Hamiltonian, and uh, uh, we may or may not be able uh, to write... Uh, uh, the solution to this model, I mean, how the system evolves and uh, uh, what the energy states are, uh, we may or may not be able to do that uh, in, in a closed form as an analytic expression. And there are some more technical definitions uh, uh, of exact solvability. Uh, this is an example from classical mechanics. Uh, one can solve... Uh, uh, the two-body problem uh, with uh, Newton's law attraction, like uh, the Earth moves around the Sun, it moves uh, moves along uh, an elliptical orbit, and uh, everything can be uh, written in a closed form. Uh, with three bodies, uh, there is no such simple solution. Uh, in uh, quantum many-body physics. Uh, we can uh, consider models with spins or uh, electrons, and uh, only a small fraction of models are exactly solvable. And in that paper, uh, I described a new model, uh, actually a pretty interesting model, because uh, uh, it's a spin model. Uh, it's not based on uh, uh, symmetries. There are some symmetries, but... Uh, 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 the model features anions that are not related to those symmetries. Uh, depending on uh, parameters, those model, uh, those anions can be abelian or non-abelian. Uh, so there is a bunch of interesting properties. Uh, yeah, that's it. On the question, actually, uh, oh, I, I, I just uh, I want to say that. Uh, Right now, people are, are, are studying some uh, possible experimental realizations of this model. The experimental picture is not very clear because one cannot make uh, the, the exact same interaction in practice, but uh, one can come close. And uh, there are some ca uh, candidate materials that uh, uh, seem to be described by the same Hamiltonian and might uh, also harbor anions, but uh, that has not been confirmed. On the question of abelian and non-abelian, that same year, you worked on non-abelian statistics in the fractional quantum Hall state. What was some of that work? Non-abelian statistics? Uh, well, I don't remember this work. Uh, actually, uh, non-abelian statistics in uh, fractional quantum Hall state uh, was studied a long time ago. Uh, by Moore and Reed in particular, they were the first to discover non-abelian anions in the quantum hole setting. And uh, uh, that was, uh, I forgot what year, uh, sometime early 90s. 
So I, I, I don't remember my work on this subject. What was some of the work you were doing with Preskill on topological entanglement entropy? Uh, topological entanglement entropy. Uh, if there is a, a, a system with any ends, uh, and we uh, cut a disk out of that system, uh, one can study the entanglement between uh, the disk and uh, the spins around it. Uh, suppose this is, uh, the system is made out of spins with local interactions. Uh, and it is uh, in a ground state. When the system is uh, in its ground state uh, and uh, there are interactions, it means that uh, different parts of the systems are entangled. They can be entangled only on short distances or on longer distances, but they are entangled. Uh, when we uh, have a pure state, like uh, the ground state, and uh, we break the system into two subsystems. Uh, one can define a, a so-called entanglement entropy between these two subsystems. Uh, so uh, by definition, it's the entropy of either part. Uh, if we discard the other part, uh, uh, the remaining part uh, uh, will have some non-zero entropy. Von Neumann entropy. Uh, now, uh, you know, top, usually when uh, we have a system with local interactions and uh, uh, the ground state is sufficiently simple, uh, like uh, it doesn't have long range correlations and it, uh, the system has an energy gap, then uh, in, the amount of entanglement is proportional uh, to the length of the boundary of the cut region. And that's called uh, area law. Uh, the term area comes from high dimensions when uh, we cut a, a ball from a three-dimensional system. But uh, our work was uh, uh, about two-dimensional systems. So the entanglement is proportional to the length, usually. But when the system uh, has any ends, uh, then it's slightly less uh, than, uh, than the length. Because uh, if we allowed uh, any uh, to be in that uh, disk that we cut, it would match that uh, sim uh, simple formula. But uh, we constrain the system not to have any ends in the disk. And uh, so uh, there, there is a little bit less of entanglement. And we found a formula uh, for that difference. Uh, it, it's a beautiful formula in terms of uh, uh, so-called uh, so quantum dimensions of uh, those any ends. What is, so an the, 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 what is an interferometric experiment? Interferometric can mean uh, many things. Uh, it, uh, interferometry is uh, a phenomenon when uh, two particles can propagate uh, along uh, different paths. And uh, if uh, we just consider one particle, not two, uh, sorry, uh, in interferometry, uh, it's usually one particle that splits in a uh, quantum mechanical way, meaning that uh, uh, it forms a, a superposition of particle traveling along one path and uh, particle traveling along the other path. And then they, uh, these two particle, uh, particles meet. And uh, when they meet, uh, uh, depending on uh, the accumulated phase on each path, uh, the signal uh, can be stronger or weaker. And uh, interferometry is most commonly observed uh, with light, with photons. And uh, we don't have to think about individual photons. We can uh, think about uh, electromagnetic waves uh, or just waves uh, in optics interferometry. Uh, is described by classical equations. And uh, you may know uh, there's the, the, uh, patterns with fringes when uh, uh, light uh, goes through, uh, through two holes or two slits. Uh, when it uh, arrives at, uh, at the screen at some distance, uh, uh, the signals uh, kind of... Uh, 
interact with each other. It's not a real interaction. It's just uh, uh, both signals are important. They uh, either uh, add or subtract forming uh, a stride pattern. That is uh, interferometry in optics. Uh, people also do interferometry with electrons. Uh, and uh, what we discussed in that paper you're referring to, I, I, do you mean uh, two papers uh, uh, with um, with Feldman, uh, Dima Feldman, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, in those papers we uh, studied uh, interferometry with uh, quantum hole particles. Uh, in the uh, quantum hole effect, uh, there are particles, uh, and uh, when the effect is fractional, uh, those particles are anions. And uh, the phase, as we meet, as the two particles meet, uh, the relative phase depends on the presence or absence of anions between these two paths. And uh, uh, we were not the first to consider this uh, this problem. Uh, there had been uh, many papers on this subject. Uh, we considered a particular type of interferometer and did the calculation. Alexei, looking at your work with Dorit Aharan, Aharanov and, and, and John Preskill, when did you start thinking about fault-tolerant quantum computation? Fault-tolerant? Uh, well, uh, I started to think about it very early, uh, uh, shortly after I uh, just uh, started thinking about uh, quantum computation in general, because uh, this was clearly necessary. It was necessary to find a way to uh, protect quantum information. The first step is quantum codes, but the next step is to uh, 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 correct errors wh while doing computation, not just uh, 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 correcting errors uh, in quantum memory. So, uh, fault tolerant computation is a way uh, to do computation uh, when uh, uh, there are faults or errors and we need to deal with them and still get the correct result. Uh, so, uh, I started thinking about it, uh, say, in 1996, uh, and I had some ideas uh, based on anions, but uh, then uh, Shor's paper uh, came out in 1996, and uh, he basically solved the problem in a different way. I later wrote this, uh, this paper uh, about quantum computation with anions in 1997, uh, and uh, that was uh, motivated by uh, the need of fault tolerance. And uh, this was a, a different uh, fault tolerance scheme. Uh, So-called topological quantum computation is just uh, a particular way of fault tolerant quantum computation. Uh, and uh, with uh, Dorito Ronov, we wrote some paper, actually, I don't clearly remember what we wrote there, but uh, uh, I, I I know that uh, uh, she and uh, Ben Orr uh, came up with uh, one particular scheme of fault tolerant quantum computation, uh, and uh, they proved uh, uh, the threshold theorem for fault tolerant computation. Uh, it was one of uh, several uh, several proofs that uh, appeared uh, in late 90s but uh, uh, that was a significant step and uh, uh, we did some uh, joint work but somehow I don't remember clearly what we, what the, what we did it wasn't uh, that significant as their previous work and and long range correlated noise with fault tolerant quantum computation what does that mean long range correlated noise Long range correlated noise. It means that uh, uh, there are errors that 
simultaneously affect multiple qubits at, uh, separated by a large distance. Usually we assume that uh, when an er error happens, uh, only one qubit is affected. Maybe two qubits uh, uh, that are adjacent to each other. But uh, with correlated noise, uh, uh, many qubits can be affected, or two qubits separated by a large distance. Yet another question on universality, your work with John on topological entanglement entropy. What does that mean? Topological entanglement entropy. Uh, yeah, uh, we've just talked about this. Uh, it's an uh, entanglement between uh, a, a disk and uh, uh, the remaining part of the system. And how does that relate to broader concepts of entropy in physics and mechanics? Entropy uh, is a, a general concept. Uh, entropy is defined uh, for a probability distribution, uh, the Shannon entropy. And it, uh, it's also defined for a quantum state, uh, for a mixed quantum state. Uh, that's called von Neumann entropy. Uh, these are mathematical concepts, and uh, uh, there is uh, an interesting theory uh, describing entropy in general and uh, properties like uh, subadditivity and uh, uh, other mathematical properties. Now, uh, entropy has uh, applications in physics and uh, in information theory. Uh, Shannon and in, 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 used entropy to describe uh, bounds on information transmission. But uh, uh, in physics, in particular, entropy uh, is usually used in thermodynamics. Uh, it's a thermodynamic uh, property of a system. Uh, these days, people uh, compute uh, entanglement entropy, which doesn't have uh, such a clear phys uh, physical interpretation as uh, the thermodynamic entropy. Entanglement entropy is when we start uh, with a pure state and then artificially uh, divide the system into two parts and compute the entropy uh, of one part. Uh, and uh, so far it has been uh, just uh, mathematical curiosity. I'm not sure if it will ever become uh, significant physical concept. Uh, in, in some cases, it matches the thermodynamic entropy, in particular, when we talk about uh, the so-called uh, thermophile double state. The thermophile double state is uh, uh, when we have a ther uh, thermodynamic state, which is a mixed state, we can double the system and construct a pure state, such that uh, its restriction on one part uh, gives uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the original uh, mixed state. And uh, this is again an artificial construction, but uh, there are some uh, rare examples where this uh, uh, thermophile double uh, uh, has a physical realization, uh, natural physical realization. But uh, in most cases, it's just uh, mathematical curiosity. Alexei, your proposal on a, pro a protected qubit based on a superconducting current mirror, what, what kind of a mirror is that? Current mirror means uh, it's a device such that if we pass current between uh, uh, two terminals, we induce current uh, going through uh, two other terminals. Uh, of course, they, uh, they should allow... Uh, current coming in and going out, otherwise uh, uh, the device would break or would not function properly. But uh, if we uh, say a short circuit the, the other two terminals and pass current uh, from terminals one and between terminals one and two, then we'll drive uh, the equal amount of current between the two other terminals in that loop, in the closed loop. So. Uh, such devices exist uh, 
practical devices uh, are classical in the sense that uh, uh, they don't preserve quantum coherence. You, you cannot operate them in a quantum regime such that uh, uh, you construct superpositions between uh, states with different currents and things like that. It, uh, they won't work in this regime. But uh, I proposed a, a device that could work in the quantum regime. And uh, it, it could be useful to uh, implement qubits. Alexei, what is an electronic Mach Zender interferometer? Uh, Mach Zender interferometer is, uh, uh, well, it was the particular type of uh, interferometer we studied with Dima Feldman. And uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, a picture is re is required, but uh, uh, an electronic interferometer that operates uh, in, in uh, the quantum Hubble regime uh, usually. Uh, let me describe a simple type of interferometer, not Max Zender. Uh, we can have uh, a stripe of quantum hole liquid with two constrictions, and. Uh, uh, there are uh, waves, or you may say quantum particles, uh, edge modes propagating along the edges. But uh, in the constriction, uh, a particle can tunnel uh, between the two edges. And if there are two constrictions, uh, uh, that particle can tunnel along uh, uh, two different paths through one constriction or the other constriction. So it's like a, a, a river and uh, there is some narrow place and uh, uh, a particle can jump across the river. Uh, and there are, if there are two such places, it can jump uh, uh, in either places and kind of simultaneously, uh, meaning that a uh, particle going uh, one way adds up uh, to particle uh, going through the other way. Now, uh, a, a Max Zender interferometer is a different topology, uh, and it requires uh, an overpass. So it's some uh, thing where we have this three where it splits, and uh, uh, one part of the uh, of this uh, one of this two stripes uh, should go over over another. It, it, it's hard to explain. And I, actually, I don't remember it uh, right now. I, I would need to uh, recall or look at the paper. I'm not sure how much of a, a role you had in this multi-author paper. It's a very interesting title, Interacting Anions in Topological Quantum Liquids, The Golden Chain. What is the golden chain? What does that mean? Oh, uh, the golden chain refers to uh, the golden ratio. It's just a number, one plus square root of five over two. Uh, uh, this uh, golden ratio uh, was um, given some significance by uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, but um, it's just a number that. Uh, uh, often appears in, in some elementary problems. And uh, uh, this chain was a chain made uh, of anions and uh, uh, the fusion and breaking roots of those anions contain the golden ratio. Uh, just uh, the formulas contain the golden ratio. What um, And what is golden about the golden ratio? What is golden? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't remember uh, who uh, proposed the, proposed this. Uh, it, it, it goes back to very early history of uh, mathematics, but uh, uh, it's not even mathematics uh, proper because. Uh, uh, this golden ratio is kind of a, a perfect uh, uh, proportion, and uh, uh, one can find uh, the, uh, those ratios uh, 
uh, in, in human body and in other object uh, like uh, uh, the height and the width uh, are not different by a factor of two, not uh, not by one. If the person is too tall, it uh, can, uh, can, uh, can be too short, but uh, something in between. Uh, it's, it's not the proportion of, of a person. It relates to some other things with, which I don't remember. Um, but it's uh, uh, like 1.6, and it looks uh, pleasing uh, in, in many cases. It's elegant, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many questions on the paper, non-commuting flux se sectors in a tabletop experiment. First, I wonder if you can talk about the use of Josephson junctions, which I know have a very rich history in physics. Uh, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? So in, in the paper, non-commuting flux sectors in a tabletop experiment, you talk about using Josephson junctions. Uh, right. Uh, we actually used the current mirror. Yeah, the current mirror was made of Josephson junctions, and we proposed the use of uh, the current mirror. But uh, uh, that paper is something... Uh, quite abstract. It's related uh, to previous work uh, uh, by Greg Moore. Uh, and uh, in his previous work, uh, he noticed that uh, uh, the Maxwell theory or usual electrodynamics, of course, it must be uh, quantum electrodynamics. Uh, his topo uh, non-trivial topological features, if we put it uh, on uh, non-trivial manifolds, not just uh, uh, this three-dimensional space, but some non-trivial manifolds, like uh, uh, the three-dimensional projective space. And, uh, uh, of course, in practice, we cannot uh, make such manifolds, because we live in flat space, we cannot uh, curve this space uh, and make uh, this non-trivial topology. But uh, in, in, in this paper, we try to simulate non-trivial topology, uh, trying to fake this non-trivial topology uh, using those current mirrors. Now you, so, say, uh, you say the paper is very abstract, and yet in the title it says it's a tabletop experiment. Was there an actual experiment conducted? Well, I don't think uh, people will make such an experiment, uh, but uh, it uh, it sounds like a tabletop experiment uh, uh, to a field theorist because uh, the previous uh, the previous work uh, by Greg Moore was about uh, non trivial non trivial topologies, uh, which are hard to come by, and compared to that. Uh, using uh, the current mirror is easy, but uh, for an actual experimentalist who is uh, touched with this problem, it uh, will be very hard. <laughs> so, uh, basically, it's something that uh, can be done in principle in our three-dimensional world. It, it doesn't say it's easy to do. Alexei, around this time, 2006-2007, even if this particular experiment would have been very difficult to do, had the field progressed to a point where experimentalists and theorists were working more together in a way that ultimately would lead to the creation of IQIM, adding matter to the IQI? Oh, you mean... Uh, you mean... Uh... Realizing all, all, all these theoretical concepts. Yeah, so in, in other words, to think about it more broadly. So in the very early years of quantum information, it was only theorists thinking about very abstract concepts. And then as we get closer to 2010, 2011, more condensed matter theorists and experimentalists become involved. And that's one of the deeper stories of the creation of IQIM. 
So I'm just thinking about, you know, when you're thinking about Joseph's injunctions and superconductivity on a theoretical tabletop experiment, if that suggests that at this point in the field, there is a certain maturity which allows for collaborations that might not have been possible a decade earlier. Uh, there is certainly more maturity now than uh, it, it was before. Uh, so uh, it's not completely true that uh, there were only theories uh, in, in the early days of quantum computation. Uh, there were also uh, people doing quantum optics. Quantum optics uh, uh, have been an established field for, for a few decades. And you would consider yeah. quantum optics to be a part of quantum information? Well, quantum information is kind of meta, uh, meta subject. Uh, you can do, uh, well, I would say uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, new concepts uh, were invented that uh, belong to quantum information proper and uh, uh, people figured how to do quantum computation in principle. Uh, this is very important and uh, this is a, a separate development. Uh, it's separate from any concrete field in physics. Uh, these days, uh, it, the subject uh, requires practical application of, of these ideas and uh, uh, therefore uh, there will be separate developments in different uh, different subfields, uh, like uh, uh, doing some experiments using uh, uh, quantum optics, uh, say uh, uh, trapped atoms or uh, ions, or uh, doing experiments using uh, Jason junctions and uh, other uh, other physical systems. So. Uh, there is a, a quantum information as a theoretical subject. Uh, still, uh, new developments happen, and uh, some new developments are related to quantum gravity, actually, uh, in quantum information. People find connections between gravity, quantum gravity, and quantum information. But uh, on the practical side, uh, when it comes to uh, implementation, uh, it's uh, system dependent and uh, uh, quantum optics is uh, uh, one area where people not necessarily focus on uh, uh, information theoretic application that uh, they just do some uh, very fine experiments with, with, uh, with atom and light. And uh, some of them are, are useful to do quantum computation or other information processing tasks, but other maybe just uh, interesting on their own. And the same is true uh, for condensed matter systems like uh, Joseon junctions. People uh, can uh, build uh, superconducting qubits out of Joseon junctions or they can do other things. So on the experimental side, I mean it's not that much of uh, information as uh, uh, concrete subjects. You need to solve concrete problems in, in, in those fields. Alexei, I'm looking at your work on 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 condo impurities, quasi-particle poisoning, and Josephson current fluctuations. Are condo impurities related to the condo effect? Condo impurities uh, uh, certainly are related to the condo effect. Uh, uh, this is a type of impurity. Uh, for which uh, Kondo uh, wrote his model in, in solid. So uh, the Kondo effect uh, has to do with uh, uh, spin impurities in metals. And when uh, a localized spin interacts with, uh, uh, with uh, electrons in, in the metal, uh, there are various effects. The original uh, Kondo effect uh, is uh, the increase of uh, uh, scattering and uh, the resulting increase in the electric resistance at low temperatures due to those interactions. But uh, uh, Kondo impurities 
Uh, are you referring to uh, our paper with uh, Lea Fiofi and Laura Faro? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, that paper uh, was not really, really, well, how to say it? It, it, it was motivated by some idea of uh, of, of noise source in a, super, in a superconducting device. So we uh, hypothesized that uh, uh, condo impurities uh, co uh, cause uh, certain bad effects in, su in superconducting devices. And uh, we just came up with some uh, model of a condo impurity in, in a superconductor. And what is a quasi-particle poisoning? What does that mean? Quasi-particle poisoning. Uh, that refers to uh, uh, a process in a superconducting uh, qubit that uh, destroys the encoded state. Uh, so uh, the uh, okay, how to say to make superconducting qubits, uh, the system needs to be at a very low temperature. Uh, it, the temperature needs to be low for uh, several reason, uh, reasons. One of them is uh, to suppress uh, Bogolubov quasi-particles in, in the superconductor. At uh, temperatures of the order of the transition temperature, there are many uh, quasi-particles, and uh, they will interfere with uh, the work of the Jason junction uh, so we want to get rid of them. Uh, when the temperature uh, is uh, much lower than uh, the superconducting transition temperature, like uh, in aluminum, the transition occurs at about one Kelvin, and uh, the system can work, uh, uh, say, at 20 millikelvin, uh, 50 times uh, below the transition temperature. Uh, then uh, uh, the density of equilibrium quasi-particles is negligible. Uh, we may not see an equilibrium quasi-particle uh, in the time of experiment, and maybe even days or years. I don't uh, know the exact numbers, but uh, uh, if you estimate uh, the density of those quasi-particles, it, uh, it's very low. In reality, there are quasi-particles uh, which are not at thermal equilibrium. They're produced by uh, other mechanisms. And one mechanism that uh, people are very concerned about right now is cosmic rays. Why, it's why so? Difficult. It's very difficult to shield the system from cosmic rays. It's, uh, there are other mechanisms, like uh, if the system uh, lives in, uh, in a cryostat, and uh, uh, some electromagnetic re uh, radiation can leak in, uh, into the cryostat through various holes or imperfections uh, in the design, like uh, uh, Elon wires that go in the cryostat. That also happens. Uh, a photon uh, can get in and produce uh, quasi-particles. But, uh, that uh, can be mitigated uh, by better design. Uh, with cosmic rays, it's uh, hard to avoid them. They're everywhere. They're, they're not uh, very strong. I mean, uh, uh, a, a particle will hit the device uh, only once in a few seconds. But uh, when it happens, it produces uh, lots of quasi-particles. And uh, uh, they basically shut down the device uh, for some time. Uh, those quasi-particles uh, uh, enter adjacent junctions and uh, uh, produce various errors. The, the device uh, just doesn't function properly for, uh, while those quasi-particles exist. Eventually, they uh, mostly dissipate. Uh, some of them get trapped uh, such that uh, they don't cause uh, too much trouble. But... Uh, uh, when they move around in the device, uh, superconducting qubits cannot work. 
Alexei, are quasi-particles related at all to quasi-crystals? No, not at all. Totally separate. Right. Have you been involved in quasi-crystal research at all? Yes, I was involved in it uh, very early. Uh, that was uh, the first topic I worked on uh, as a student. So, Did you follow Paul Steinhardt's quest to find a quasi-crystal at all? Oh, you mean uh, find a natural quasi-crystal? Right. Yeah, I heard his talk. It's, uh, it's very funny. Yeah, it's a very nice story. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, yes. <laughs> He's kind of an Indiana Jones as a physicist searching for this. Right, right. <laughs> Alexei, tell me about your work with William Webb on wave, fun wave function preparation and resampling. What does resampling mean using a quantum computer? Oh, it's... a. Uh, it's difficult to describe exactly. It's, it's a quantum algorithm. Uh, and uh, it's one of uh, those algorithms that they deal with uh, real numbers. Uh, so the goal is to represent uh, real numbers in a uh, quantum computer. And uh, you should not try to represent a particular real number. Uh, because uh, it's impossible even with a, a classical computer. Uh, with a classical computer, uh, you always uh, have some number of precision bits, uh, and you can only uh, represent uh, a number to that precision. Uh, in a quantum computer, it, it would be wrong to just uh, represent uh, uh, the number uh, by basis state uh, is the one that you would use in, in the classical computer. And the correct way to uh, deal with numbers is to create a superposition of nearby nearby numbers that will uh, differ uh, in the last few digits of uh, the binary representation. Uh, so resampling is uh, a particular trick to uh, deal with such superpositions. Your paper in 2009, single author, periodic table for topological insulators and superconductors. Is that to say that topological insulators and superconductors need their own periodic table? Uh, at that time, people were discovering uh, new topological phases, and I uh, observed that uh, you would restrict attention to uh, a certain class of systems, uh, systems uh, with non-interacting fermions that uh, uh, allow description by a quadratic Hamiltonian in terms of fermions. Uh, then, uh, one can now organize different phases in, in, into a table, uh, and it has periodicity. Uh, well, uh, periodicity had been known in mathematics uh, for a number of years. It, it's called uh, bot periodicity in K-theory. It, it was discovered uh, by bot, uh, I think, in 1959 uh, as a mathematical fact. And uh, I made a connection of, uh, uh, between case theory and topological phases. And uh, this title was just uh, uh, something I came up with uh, that uh, uh, sounds interesting. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, indeed, uh, phases of, uh, with different symmetries and different dimensions uh, exhibit some per uh, periodicity. If we go to one dimension higher, uh, say from two to three dimensions, uh, you have to change symmetry in, in a certain way, and uh, you basically get the same set of faces in, as in two dimensions. Alexei, that same year in 2008, you were named a MacArthur Fellow. 
What was it like when you received that news, and what did the MacArthur Fellowship allow you to do? Uh, well, it felt great. Uh, uh, I'm uh, grateful to the MacArthur Foundation for giving me this prize. Uh, and uh, they actually allowed me to do anything with, with this money. It was just uh, uh, personal money. And uh, uh, the goal is uh, so that uh, uh, people are more flexible in uh, doing things uh, like uh, can spend uh, money on something they would uh, uh, otherwise uh, try to, to save on, like uh, buying books in my case. I, in my case, it uh, didn't mean very unusual things, but for, for somebody it might mean traveling to an unusual place and uh, that uh, might be related to the, to the uh, well, my, might inspire some new, new thoughts and things like that. But for me, it was uh, uh, more mundane. But it's still great to, to have some extra money. I wonder, Alexei, you know, 10 years, 12 years after you started thinking about these things, when the field was so young, what did it mean for quantum information more generally that a prestigious organization like the MacArthur Foundation was recognizing your research? Uh, well, they, uh, of course, they know better, but uh, I guess it was <laughs> just uh, the sum of my individual results. And uh, I did some good work on quantum computation, and uh, they recognized that, that work. Uh, so it was... Uh, if I remember correctly, for topological quantum computation. Back to the research, Alexei. Topological classification of free fermion systems. What are free fermion systems? A free fermion sy system is such a system where uh, interactions between electrons of the fermions can be neglected. And... Uh, uh, such systems uh, are mathematically described by a Hamiltonian that is quadratic in the creation and, and the annihilation apparatus. It contains terms like uh, uh, AJ, AK dagger, or AJ, AJ in, term, in the case of superconducting. Anionic quantum liquids, your work topology driven quantum phase transitions in time reversal invariant anionic quantum liquids. Are these actual liquids or this is a, a theoretical construct? It's a theoretical construct. Uh, people talk about uh, electron liquids and spin liquids. And uh, the meaning of uh, the word liquid uh, is probably not what you think. Uh, it doesn't mean the system is uh, actually fluid. It uh, means that uh, uh, it's different from, uh, say, a crystal or a gas. Let me uh, be more specific. Uh, an ordinary material like water can be uh, in a solid phase uh, where uh, atoms uh, or molecules uh, uh, are arranged periodically. It can be in a liquid phase and it can be in a gas phase. Uh, solids uh, are characterized by order, meaning that uh, uh, one can, uh, well, it's hard to explain all these concepts, but uh, uh, intuitively it, it means uh, that uh, uh, the molecules uh, are arranged periodically and uh, in particular, uh, they are oriented in a certain direction. And uh, this orientation is preferred by the system compared to any other orientation. And also certain positions are preferred to uh, other positions because they are arranged periodically. Uh, 
in, in a liquid or in a gas, there is no order. Uh, and in fact, uh, liquid and gas are not fundamentally different phases. Uh, these are just uh, uh, two extreme cases uh, of one phase. But uh, it's important that in a gas, uh, uh, interactions are weak because the density is low. And in a liquid, uh, uh, molecules are tightly packed and uh, the interactions are strong. And uh, uh, by analogy, people uh, distinguish uh, solids uh, in, say, spin systems where uh, th uh, there is an ordering. For example, uh, an antiferromagnet is uh, a simple example of uh, a solid, so to speak, where uh, spins uh, are periodically arranged. The spins themselves are locked in the crystal lines. They cannot move. But uh, they can rotate, and uh, in an antiferromagnet, uh, they uh, form uh, a checkerboard pattern. Uh, if it's a two-dimensional system, uh, spin up and spin down, like uh, uh, the white and black uh, squares. Uh, so, and they checkerboard pattern, uh, and uh, there are other solids where uh, spins. Uh, arranged differ, uh, differently. They might not uh, have a preferred direction. They might just uh, uh, break into pairs and each pair will be uh, entangled between themselves, but uh, they will be separate entangled pairs. And a liquid is uh, uh, something that doesn't have order at all. And usually uh, uh, those liquids have other interesting properties instead of ordering. Uh, they might uh, uh, harbor anions. I, I mean, uh, the liquid uh, is the ground state and uh, uh, quasi-particles or excitations in, in the system uh, are anions. So instead of having order, they, ha uh, they have uh, other interesting properties, more interesting than order. Alexei, many questions on the paper, Power Law Spin Correlations in a Perturbed Honeycomb Spin Model. So let's start with the honeycomb spin model. What is that? Uh, the honeycomb spin model is, is uh, uh, that model I, I proposed in, in, in the paper, uh, anions uh, in an exactly solvable model and beyond. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, that's the model. But I don't remember the paper you're referring to. This is in 2010. 2010 and... Uh, with Tikhanov uh, and, and Feigelman. Uh, with Tikhanov and Feigelman. Tikhanov. Uh, yeah, well, right now I vaguely remember this uh, because uh, it, it must be uh, because I, my contribution was negligible in this paper. What are what are power law spin correlations? What does that mean? Uh, it means that uh, as a function of the distance between two spins, uh, it decays as a power law, like uh, the distance uh, one over the distance uh, squared, for example. Uh, that should be contrasted with exponential decay. Like e to the minus the distance. Now that same year, you looked at one dimension, topological phases of fermions in one dimension. Are, are there other dimensions that these phases exist in? Topological phases of fermions exist in uh, uh, all dimensions. Uh, but we studied a concrete model in one dimension with Lukas Fitkowski, is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And what, what is that one dimension? What does that mean? If they're in all dimensions, what, what's the focus on one dimension? In one dimension means uh, it's, a, uh, it's, uh, it's a chain. It's a chain of fermionic sites. Uh, there are sites between which uh, fermions can, uh, can move. Well, uh, in, 
in one dim uh, dimension, uh, things are easier than in two dimensions, and uh, even easier than in uh, three dimensions. Uh, so consider the con uh, concrete question in one dimension and solve it. But uh, it's very hard to explain it because it's a technical question. But are they the dimensions that we think about that govern time and space? Is it space? Uh, uh, they govern space. Uh, of course, we live in a, a three spatial dimension and one time dimension. Mathematically, uh, we can consider problems in uh, any number of spatial dimensions. It's not clear how to deal with uh, two dimensional time. People don't do that usually. But uh, one can add more spatial dimensions. Uh, in practice, uh, all dimensions uh, from zero to three uh, can be realized. Zero means uh, it's just a very small system uh, that consists maybe uh, of a few atoms th that interact somehow. And one means that uh, uh, it's either a chain of atoms. Uh, there are crystals that uh, consist of individual chains. So each, uh, each chain uh, works as a one-dimensional system. And there are also uh, engineered systems like nanowires. Uh, then you have just a single wire where electron uh, moves strictly in one dimension. They can wiggle a bit in the perpendicular direction, but uh, uh, at low temperature, this wiggling is suppressed. And uh, one can do two-dimensional systems, uh, quantum hole systems, I realized, uh, is two-dimensional systems. Electrons are confined uh, to some layer, and it can be either um, like a layer uh, cake uh, of different materials where one layer carries electrons. Uh, or it can be uh, a two-dimensional material like uh, graphene. Graphene is a popular material now. It's uh, strictly two-dimensional, just one sheet of uh, uh, carbon atoms. So uh, this is how uh, one and two-dimensional uh, systems are made. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's practical to uh, study some uh, some models uh, in one and two dimensions, and uh, hopefully those models uh, uh, can be realized experimentally. Alexei, is graphene going to be an important material for building a scalable quantum computer? Uh, I don't know. Uh, people are not using graphene right now. But who knows? What are some of the obvious materials, even now, that are likely to be relevant for building scalable quantum computers? I cannot tell. Right now, people are using aluminum for superconducting quantum computers. Uh, there are actually uh, several uh, technologies that uh, might produce a quantum computer eventually, I mean existing technologies, uh, they include uh, uh, trapped atoms. It's not a material, it's just uh, uh, atoms in vacuum that are trapped by electromagnetic fields. Uh, another technology is based on superconductors, and there's uh, the most popular superconductor is aluminum. Uh, aluminum is used not because it's a good superconductor. It, it, it's, uh, super, uh, it's superconducting only at temperatures below one Kelvin. Uh, it's used because people know how to make uh, a good JSON junction out of uh, aluminum oxide. That's the only reason. It's a technological reason. They just uh, developed a technology of uh, uh, making this structure. They have uh, uh, aluminum. Um, uh, the uh, create uh, a very thin film of aluminum oxide and then can deposit another layer of aluminum. Only because they know how to do it, they, uh, they use it. Uh, and uh, if people figure how to do the same thing with uh, 
say niobium, they kind of uh, kind of know, but uh, uh, it's harder. If they uh, can scale scale up uh, such dash injunction, uh, improve their quality, they might switch to niobium because it has uh, higher tr uh, superconducting transition temperature. Is so, this is this know. is this the approach that Google is pursuing using aluminum for superconductivity? Yeah, yeah. Uh, currently, uh, I believe all groups use aluminum, including Microsoft. No, uh, Microsoft uh, uses uh, something else entirely. Uh, they're trying to use the, those nanowires uh, with my runner modes. And uh, nanowires uh, per se might not work. I mean, uh, physical nanowires that are grown as uh, individual crystals because they uh, have a lot of defects on, uh, on the surface. And uh, they're trying to improve the technology. And uh, well, I don't know what exactly they're doing right now, but one way is to uh, fabricate uh, those wires uh, in a planar structure. So uh, it won't be a physically cut wire. It will be just uh, uh, some potential that confines electrons to one-dimensional region. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure if they are pursuing this path, but uh, somehow they need to uh, solve the problem of impurities uh, that exist in the large numbers in, in those nanowires. Alexei, back to the research in 2011, your work with Liang Kang on building models for gapped boundaries and domain walls. What are gapped boundaries? Gapped boundaries uh, means that, um, well, uh, I can start with what a gap means in general. Uh, a gap means an energy gap, and uh, if we uh, build some material, cool it down to very low temperature, uh, then uh, the individual degrees of freedom in that material, like electrons, uh, form a ground state. And uh, producing a particle may be uh, easy or hard. It may require a finite amount of energy, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, suppose the system is at uh, 5 millikelvin and uh, uh, in uh, aluminum, we previously discussed, one uh, can produce uh, Bogolubov quasi-particles and their energy is uh, uh, about 2 kelvin. I don't remember the exact number, oh, of the order of 2 kelvin. So, uh, that is uh, the energy gap. One needs to uh, put a certain amount of energy uh, to produce an, an excitation, and uh, below that, no excitations will be produced. Uh, if it's not aluminum, uh, but copper, uh, it's a gapless system. Uh, copper remains non-superconducting at uh, those temperatures. And uh, uh, one can produce a, a, an excitation uh, like an electron or, or a hole with arbitrary small energies. That is called gapless. Uh, now, certain systems are gapped in the bulk, but uh, their boundary is gapless. And uh, uh, three-dimensional materials like, uh, like that are called uh, topological insulators or topological superconductors, in particular in a topological insulator, uh, there is an energy gap in the bulk, but uh, uh, electrons at the surface uh, do not require any uh, gap, any uh, fixed energy uh, uh, to be added or removed. Uh, and uh, you talked about, uh, about a paper on topological systems, and uh, this was a class of topological systems that are gapped both at the bulk and on the boundary. 
Finally, Alexei, last question for today. Same year in 2011. Tell me about developing a technique on dissipationless dynamics of randomly coupled spins at high temperatures. What does that mean, dissipationless dynamics? I, frankly, I don't remember the paper. Do you know what, do you remember what that means, that the phrase dissipationless dynamics? Uh, let me look up the paper and see what... Uh, this is what also with about. Lara Faro and, and Levy. Oh, yeah, 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 then I remember. Uh, this, uh, still, let me, let me just check if it's the same paper. No. Did you say 2011? Yes. Uh. It's in the chat. Oh, in the chat, uh, just a second. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Uh, yeah, yeah, I've I, I look, looked at the paper and now I understand why it's called dissipation as dynamics. So uh, we considered the model of interacting spins. And uh, uh, that has to, uh, this dissipationless uh, word uh, has to do with the justification of the model. Uh, we uh, had to justify that uh, those spins uh, only interact between themselves and uh, with nothing else. Uh, typically, uh, spins inter interact with other degrees of freedom in the system, and uh, that causes the dissipation of energy. Basically, the energy can exchange between the spin subsystem and other systems. And uh, we can see that uh, spins embedded in a superconductor, uh, where uh, there is an energy gap, as we uh, discussed previously, and uh, uh, when spins flip, uh, they cannot excite uh, quasi-particles in the superconductor. And that's why the only important interaction is the interaction between the spins themselves. And we solved a particular problem of, of their dynamics, with, uh, calculated uh, fluctuations that occur at uh, various time scales, both long and short. And why the focus on high temperatures? What does that mean here, high temperatures? High temperature uh, means uh, that the temperature is greater than 
the interaction energy between two spins. And that energy is extremely low. So uh, temperature like uh, 50 millikelvin uh, would be considered as hot for this purpose. And if we can translate that millikelvin into Fahrenheit or Celsius, what does that mean? What temperature are we, we looking at? Uh, Celsius, uh, the absolute zero is uh, minus uh, 273 Celsius uh, plus, uh, I forgot the, the other digits. And uh, above that, it will be just uh, uh, one twentieth uh, of Celsius higher. So when you mean high temperatures, they're actually quite cold temperatures in the way that we perceive temperatures. Yeah, yeah, but physicists consider uh, uh, absolute temperatures, temperatures above uh, uh, this specific temperature, which corresponds to absolute zero. Right. It means no energy. A very different conception of temperatures, of course. Uh, yeah. Well, Alexei, on that note, we'll pick up next time from 2012, and we'll bring the story right up to the present.